Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the many things that delight and also at times terrifies me on the internet are those memes and videos in the realm of 80s nostalgia. So the terror is in memes like one I saw this past week, which pointed out that The Wonder Years, a show I loved and that seemed to reflect a very different idyllic past set far, far, far long ago, that The Wonder Years was set 20 years before it actually took place. That means that if The Wonder Years were to go on the air today, it would be set in the year 2001, which was 20 years ago, apparently, <laughs> which just seems rude. Similarly, there's a delight in these videos, maybe you've seen them, of kids today being shown devices from the 80s, like a Walkman or, or one of those 110 millimeter cameras, right? Or, or even just a phone with a cord on it or an answering machine and watching the kids try to figure out how it works or what it even is. It's hilarious and also a little terrifying. Now, of course, this kind of nostalgia is no stranger to the church, particularly to mainline Christianity, which has experienced a sharp decline over the past several decades. So it's very easy for us to look at buildings that were constructed in the middle of the 20th century, like our parish hall complex, at a time when it was socially expected for everyone to attend church, to look at buildings like that and to wax nostalgic about how good it was then with Sunday school classrooms full of the bursting multiple choirs, pews packed tight with people for Sunday worship all dressed in their best. Oh, how good it was then. Of course, in 2021, we can even practice nostalgia for what the church was like in 2019, right? Remember 2019? That was great. You could actually come to church, sit with people you knew, who Easter could be full. That was, that was great. But now, here we are, distanced and masked, hoping to make good decisions to keep one another safe from a deadly disease as cases continue to rise sharply in Michigan and wondering perhaps if we'll ever really return to the way things were, to the church, not even from long ago, just the church from two years ago would be nice. In some ways, the reading from the Acts of the Apostles appointed for today seems like a similar exercise in nostalgia, looking back at a time when things seemed simpler, even somehow better than they are today. Luke, the author of the Acts of the Apostles, looks back 50 or 60 years from his own time to the very beginnings of the church. And we hear in Luke's memory of that early church that Quote, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one claimed private ownership of any possessions. Every thing they owned was held in common. Those were the days. Now, the admittedly rather liberal Episcopalian in me, with a strong tradition to the English and Anglo-Catholic traditions of Christian socialism, absolutely loves this text. It's very tempting to argue that look at this here, right at the very foundations of Christianity, one can find a commitment to my own political and economic principles. How convenient. Yay. But of course, anytime you find your own opinions so clearly affirmed in the biblical text, the wise thing to do is not to go, yay, I was right all along. Rather, the wise thing to do is to take a step back, take a deep breath, calm down dig maybe a little more deeply into the text because the Bible very rarely functions simply to tell us that we're right. Rather, Scripture exists to convict our hearts while at the same time giving us the glorious news that we're saved nonetheless. So with that in mind, what in the world is going on with this seemingly perfect and almost socialist church of the first century described in Acts 4? Could Jared possibly be wrong in his hopes? Probably. First, remember that the Acts of the Apostles generally falls into two parts, right? The first 12 chapters of Acts describes the Jewish church founded in Jerusalem with Peter, James, and the other apostles functioning as its leaders. 
Beginning in chapter 13 of Acts, however, the focus shifts to describe the growth of the mission of the church among the Gentiles, led principally at this time that mission by St. Paul, the former persecutor of the Jewish church, who winds up converted and who leads the expansion of the church from Jerusalem to Antioch to the other major cities of the Greco-Roman Empire and eventually even to Rome itself. So we're in chapter 4, that means we're in the first part of the book, the growth of the Jewish church. In the previous chapter, chapter 3 of Acts, Luke described how after the miracle of Pentecost in Acts 2, that after that happened, Peter was going to the temple and he healed a beggar who was crippled, just as Jesus and Luke so often healed those who were infirm. Peter and John then preached at the temple, just like Jesus used to, only to be brought before the Sanhedrin, just like Jesus wound up being, because their preaching was so unsettling to the religious leadership at the time. Maybe you're getting the theme here, just like Jesus' preaching was. The temple authorities wanted to persecute Peter and John, but they were unable to because they couldn't deny the fact that they just healed a lame man, and that had made kind of an impact on the people of Jerusalem. So the temple authorities threatened them, kind of wagged their finger, and then have to release them in the end. And after Peter and John are released, all those early Christians, you know, probably about 5,000, Luke is saying at this time, they all gathered together. And they prayed for God to strengthen the church in the face of this persecution that was beginning. You see, things were not all that rosy back then, after all. The early Christians prayed for the Holy Spirit to give them boldness. Boldness to continue to do the works of healing and goodness which began in Jesus Christ. And in response, the place where the believers are gathered in chapter 3 is shaken. And in the words of the text, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Almost a second Pentecost event, just a chapter after the first one, as the Spirit descends to strengthen the church. It's after this second descent of the Spirit that our text for today comes. Describing an early church that is united, a church that is sharing their possessions so freely that you can't even say there's a single needy person among them. This indicates that the unity and generosity of this early church is not, of course, due to the perfection of the early church, but due to the power of the Holy Spirit in the community and how that community is receptive to the power of the Spirit in their lives to get them to do uncomfortable things like talk about Jesus with boldness, like give generously of what you can to make other people's lives better. Following the ending of our text for today, the the Acts of the Apostles continues with the story of a Levite from Cyprus named Barnabas who sold a field that belonged to him and laid the proceeds at the feet of the Apostles. Kind of an example story of what we heard in this text, right? But then, right after the story of Barnabas, there's another story in chapter 5 about another household, this one a couple named Ananias and Sapphira, who similarly sell a piece of property, but who kind of hold some of it back, only pretending to give it all to the work of the church. In response to this hypocrisy, God then strikes Ananias and Sapphira both dead. Mental note, share Acts chapter 5 with the Stewardship Commission for their next meeting. Anyways... But the point, the point I think here is that though the Holy Spirit was indeed profoundly at work bringing these early Christians together, uniting them in purpose and mission, so much so that people are giving absolutely freely to the work of God, the point is that the church was not at this time perfect still. Because for every Barnabas who sold a field and gave the funds to the church, There was an Ananias and Sapphira who only pretended to give freely. And of course, as we know, the church at this time was still not yet including Gentile Christians, for example. You couldn't be a Gentile and be a member of the church. That's that's silliness. The Bible's never let Gentiles be a part of God's people. Gentiles were excluded from this seemingly perfect body. In fact, it would take another descent of the Holy Spirit several chapters later in Acts for the church to reach that level of inclusion. 
See, in the book of Acts, in the Acts of the Apostles, Luke's not trying to describe a perfect early church. Clearly, the church, even at its start, isn't perfect. Rather, Luke is trying to describe is the way the church is more and more continuing the, the ministry of Jesus that had taken place in the Gospel of Luke, continuing it more and more faithfully, bit by bit. Because remember, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, interestingly enough, in the fourth chapter of Luke's gospel, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus went to the synagogue and he read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, which said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release, release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus then proclaimed to those who were at the synagogue that today this scripture was being fulfilled in their hearing. In response, of course, the people tried to throw Jesus off a cliff. People don't always like it when God shows up to make things right. Because for God to make things right, you might have to let go of some of what you thought you had. You see, the whole Acts of the Apostles is describing how the Holy Spirit is slowly forming the church into the body of Christ today. How the Spirit is enabling the church to continue the ministry of Jesus begun in the Gospel of Luke. The Acts of the Apostles is describing how the Holy Spirit is enabling the church to fulfill the dream of Isaiah, the vision of Jesus from Luke 4, bringing good news to the poor, release to the captive, healing to the sick, and freedom to the oppressed. Luke is clear, given what transpires in chapter 5, that this fulfillment of Christ's ministry has not yet fully come about, that there are still people both within the church and without the church who will be resisting this work the Holy Spirit is doing, but that the Holy Spirit is active, nonetheless, bit by bit, making it happen. And to be honest, the original Greek doesn't quite make this the socialist dream that the New Revised Standard articulates. In fact, given the rest of the story of Acts, we know that everyone didn't immediately sell everything they owned and enter into a common trust fund way of living because that's never described anywhere else in this book. Rather, the Greek indicates that this, this selling of possessions and giving it to the apostles was something that happened, a better rendering of the Greek would be from time to time or as need arose. Make no mistake, that's still pretty remarkable, right? That when a need arose, people would freely sell everything they owned and give to meet that need. That's fantastic. But it, it's something people did to make manifest in their own time, with their own actions, the world had been imagined by Jesus, where the poor have good news, captives are released, the sick are healed, the oppressed find freedom. Yeah, and nostalgia is kind of a tricky thing. Though we're tempted to look longingly at times long past, we need to acknowledge that things were never quite as beautiful as the, we remember them to be, right? I mean, look back two years ago, 2019. If you were really sick or unable to leave your home, you couldn't go to church. You also couldn't watch it on your iPad, phone. You just had to sit where you were on Sunday, separated from your community. That world's gone now. It's not a bad thing. And in the middle of the 20th century, the church was absolutely bigger with church participation being at significantly higher rates than today. But this was because society expected it of you, right? Not because masses of people were truly choosing to give themselves fully over to the teachings of Jesus. And so, because of that, with society propping up the church and making it seemingly stronger, far too often the church, in return, propped up society, including societal systems of racial injustice, gender inequality, Let's be clear, the great church of the 20th century was also largely silent, the vast majority of it in the face of the civil rights movement, silent if not complicit in violence against the civil rights movement. We never seem to remember those old days of Christians saying, oh, Dr. King's moving too fast. Oh, these protesters shouldn't be out causing issues. Oh, they should just wait. Oh, God would never want this to happen. The world needs to be the way it is. Oh, sure, the church of the 20th century was strong and united for white, middle-class people with power, privilege, and control. 
yeah, it was great for them. So maybe longing for those good old days isn't the work we should be engaged in today as Christians. Maybe instead, in our own time, in our own context, we should be asking how the Holy Spirit is at work now, making us more faithful to what the ministry of Jesus is all about. In our own time, in our own context, the question of Acts is whether the powerful truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ still propels the church out into the world. How is the church today fulfilling the mission of Christ? How is the church today bringing good news to the poor, release to the captive, healing to the sick, and freedom to the oppressed? The dream of Isaiah proclaimed by Jesus and embodied, albeit imperfectly, by the early church was the dream of God's release of the bondage of creation being made real. It was the dream of the lifting of burdens for those who are struggling under the weight of sin and economic injustice. And that dream still needs to come true a little bit more today than it was yesterday. The church today still needs to gather in prayer that the Spirit will fill us with boldness and power to be Jesus today. And the answer to all this might not actually be found in my own slightly socialist leanings, much to my dismay. But the answer is found. It is found in asking how the church today is called to challenge injustice. The answer is found in us being willing to let the Holy Spirit move in our hearts so that we give up what we hold on to. We're willing to give it up in order to relieve the suffering of this world. We're willing to give up what we hold on to so that the church can be a place where all people can find an experience of worship that lets them know that they are loved and forgiven so that they can come to experience of formation that help them learn more about this Jesus we all follow so that the church can be active in works of justice in the world. The answer is found in being willing to give yourself to the Holy Spirit so that this world can be made new, so that you can be made new, not so it can all be like it used to be. The answer is found in being willing to give yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit so that there will never be a needy person among us. There will never be a person in need of food, or clothing, or housing. So that among us, there will never be a person in need of love, of kindness, a person in need of forgiveness for their failures, a person in need of being treated with respect and dignity. The work is giving yourself to the Holy Spirit so that those needs evaporate through the power of the resurrection, the love of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in you meeting those needs. Amen.